Yes, just a question about King George III. You've laid everything at the feet of Parliament. What was King George III's <laughs> uh, influence and role during this period? Um, so, uh, substantial. I mean, so, so George III, um, George II, his, uh, uh, George II had been a Whig in all sorts of ways. I mean, he was German-speaking, but he was very closely associated with Whig politics, uh, very close to a he's number. He's also his, his grandfather. Well, no, his that, grandfather. No, I didn't say his oh, father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. No, his grandfather, uh, uh, George II. Um, uh, um, and George, this, uh, George III, uh, the, the grandson, had been educated by a series of very conservative anti-Whiggish statesmen, uh, uh, politicians, including uh, uh, Viscount Bolingbroke, uh, Viscount Bolingbroke, who uh, as early as 1709 had said uh, that if, if we allow the debt to grow, then we'll have a social revolution in Britain, and so we need to pay down the debt immediately. That's the kind of language that, that George III had been had been taught, and he'd obviously been read uh, Bolingbroke's uh, pamphlet, of pa uh, The uh, Patriot King, um, uh, and he's very closely associated with Butte. So he's been very closely brought up with these kind of conservative politics. And the important thing that George III does um, is he tries and fails. He learns, he tries to make Butte the leading minister, and Butte is so unpopular, everybody uh, wants to get rid of him. But after that, there's a big learning curve, and George III realizes that he can get policies through. And again, I think he's very sympathetic to this sort of authoritarian Whig Tory position of tax the colonies to pay, uh, to pay down the debt. Um, he can get these through by putting ministers, not insisting that he gets, that he gets to appoint the prime minister, but putting ministers in key positions. So it's George III who makes sure that Charles Townsend becomes Chancellor of the Exchequer against Pitt's wish wishes uh, uh, in, in the 1760s. So Pitt has a temper tantrum when this happens, and George III says, you wanna, you know, I want you to be Prime Minister, uh, 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 but you've got to take this, this guy along. Um, uh, so he plays a very significant role. But I think to blame everything on George III, as a sort of older literature uh, uh, would do, is uh, he simply didn't have the power to do whatever he wanted without significant parliamentary support. So it would be impossible to imagine George III having done all of these things to uh, get through the Stamp Act, to get through uh, uh, the Townsend duties, to get, um, get through even the Coercive Acts without a significant body of support in, in Parliament. Um, he simply is able to sort of tip the balance, whereas his grandfather was able to tip the balance at key moments in the other direction. Yeah, I think George I and George II, of course, are these Hanoverians, and they're really German. Uh, and, and I'm not even sure Jan George II uh, could, could, could uh, speak English. Oh, he could, but with a heavy no, accent. A heavy yeah. accent. Uh, but uh, George III is, is reared, he's a young man, he's only 21. He, it would be as if um, uh, Charles dies in the English, and, and William becomes, immediately becomes the heir as a young man. That's what happened. He's 21 years of age, so he's really quite young for, for a king. Uh, when, Char when Charles eventually gets to the throne, depending on how, how long his mother lives, he, he's going to be an old man. But this was not the case with George III, and I think that youthfulness played into it. He... Uh, he, uh, he, he immediately wants to appoint his tutor, chief tutor, which is Butte, who's a Scot who has no strength in the House of Commons. See, George thinks of these ministers as his ministers, and they are. He hasn't yet got the, the Victorian attitude towards the Constitution, which comes slowly. The, the British Constitution, where the monarch becomes a kind of uh, 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 figurehead and not really controlling the ministry, it's hard to come by. George keeps thinking, these are my ministers. I'm going to appoint whom I want. And he goes through a series of ministers until he finds one he actually likes, North, who has support in the House of Commons. But he doesn't care about whether he has support in the House of Commons or not, because he says, these are my ministers. And so you've got this constitution in transition. It really takes another generation before you enter the period which is recognizably modern, where the queen or the king realizes that uh, they have to appoint a minister who has the support of a majority of the House of Commons. 
Uh, that's hard to come by. George certainly screws it up because he's got so, this. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, so, so, I mean, I just wanted to sort of explain constitutionally. So, in the 1690s, there are a series of parliamentary acts passed to create a notion of ministerial responsibility, that ministers are liable for their actions. In the early part of the 18th century, it, these acts were interpreted to mean that uh, the king was somehow obliged um, to go to uh, the leaders of the party that won an election to form a government. That tradition falls away in the 1740s. Um, it falls away in the 1740s because governments keep on falling. I mean, there's a series of reasons for this. And they, there's created in 1744 what was created the Broad Bottom Ministry. After the creation of, and there's all sorts of jokes about the association of the Broad Bottom Min Ministry which the, with the a significant weight of one of the ministers. So there's all these funny prints about this. Um, uh, but from the 1740s onwards, ministerial responsibility uh, no longer means that whoever wins the parliamentary election necessarily gets to form the entire government. They do this in much more and strongly in consultation with the king. So in fact, ironically, um, the Victorian constitution was much closer to being achieved in the early 18th century than in the middle of the 18th century. Um, and what George, George tries to force his own prime minister on on Britain with, with the Earl of, uh, Earl of Butte. And he realizes that's not going to work. But Butte tells him after Butte falls, because there's huge, up, uh, Butte is one of the most, in fact, the most unpopular man uh, uh, in Britain in 1762, 1763. Uh, Butte He's a tells, Scot, besides. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but after Butte tells George III, you shouldn't seek to appoint the prime minister. You should inv uh, invite whoever is the sort of most leading, the leading and most influential person in parliament to form a government. But you should insist on getting ministers in key posts who you can trust. And that's how North actually, that's, I mean, North's rise is precisely to su I mean, uh, succeeding Townsend after Townsend dies. And he's somebody, uh, he's somebody who King George III uh, recommends. And he recommends in part because uh, 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 Viscount Bar Barrington, who was Secretary of War, had been writing to George III for a long time telling about how Lord North shares his views. Um, so George III has a learning curve. He comes in as a young man. He just decides he wants to appoint his best, you know, his tutor, the man he's, uh, and he realizes that's not going to work. But what he realizes is that he can get his policies through, through somewhat more subtle, although I won't say terribly subtle means. There are no attacks of madness in this period leading up to the revolution. That comes, that's a post-revolutionary uh, affliction that, that he had. Other? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and I think there was a lot of concern at that time about who would take over uh, because it was concerned that the society might bring in a monarchy of some sort. And I wondered what the English view on who might uh, succeed uh, the role in this country. You mean in the, the society of the Cincinnati? No, no. In, in, in monarchy? The, yeah, whether a monarchy and, and what yeah. the British felt about uh, there's, was, there's, a, there's increasing happen. evidence in the 1780s of many Americans feeling that the revolution had become much too democratic, and that's the best way to describe it, that maybe we're going to have to go to a monarch. And, and you certainly have a lot of discussion of that sort. Uh, but not, it, it, it's not a dominant theme. But there, is, there are people saying this, and uh, I have a student, a, a former student, who's uncovering and he sends me all these quotations that he's uncovering from the archives of people saying, you know, 1786, this is too much. We really have to go back to a monarch. I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, Washington probably won't do it. Maybe we're going to have to bring one of the younger sons from, of George III over. There's not all that kind of talk. Uh, and there, of course, there is the presumption, given the notions of, of social development that are common in the late 18th century, the societies start from egalitarian, simple, and they progress from, well, going back to hunter-gatherer through uh, agriculture, commerce, and as you get a more sophisticated, developed society, you're going to have to have monarchy. That's the assumption. 
that's widely shared in the, in the Western world. And of course, Americans go the opposite. <laughs> we, we become much more democratic uh, in, in the period following the revolution. But there is a common theme that sooner or later we're going to have to have a monarch. And of course, the presidency, when it is created, as Jefferson says, that's an elected monarch. It's the Polish king. There is the feeling that George Washington is a kind of surrogate monarch. And I, I think that's the success of, of the, his administration. Uh, without him, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow a little bit, but without him, uh, the country would have fallen apart because he embodies monarchy. And you have to understand, people are reared in monarchy. They're used to it, that loyalty, the affection you feel for a single person. I mean, why has monarchy existed everywhere for centuries, for millennia? Uh, it, has, it, it, it satisfies a lot of, of, of human feelings. And most people in America felt that, well, sooner or later, we may have to go to that. But in the meantime, we've got this guy, Washington, who fulfills our dream. And the, the, the wonderful thing about it is that Washington wanted no part of that, because uh, he, he could have become a virtual king. He could have served until, in fact, most people, Jefferson thought Washington would serve as president until he died. So there is a lot of latent monarchical feeling. But that's offset by the, the sense that this, we're setting off in a new direction with republicanism. And, and I think that's the dominant feeling. I wouldn't want to mislead you into thinking that there's uh, strong feelings of monarchy in, in the. Uh... Uh, well, I mean, the. I, I mean, again, I mean, my, my, the point I want to keep on making is that, is that there is no British sentiment. There's divided. It's a deeply, deeply divided society. Um, and there was absolutely a pop apoplectic fear um, among some people that uh, North America would become, uh, the newly independent North America would become a new sort of French colony through a variety of uh, means. Is there a, any feelings of republicanism in, in Britain in this Oh, period? yes. No, 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 without question. There's a question. republican group at... No, 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 there's no question. I mean, I think, I think that there's, there's significant amount of, of uh, sentiment. Um, and I think, I mean, this is... Not just for Americans, but for themselves, no, no, to no, overthrow for themselves, the no. British monarchy. Well, there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's sense of, the sense of extreme limitations on the power of the king. Um, and the argument is made over and over again um, that what we need to do is limit royal power, um, and what we need to do is, uh, and, you know, this is a, the 1780s is dominated by a rhetoric of the ins importance of parliamentary reform to make Parliament more responsive uh, to the uh, to the will uh, to the will of the people in Britain, um, and and this plays an extremely important role. And I think one should see the massive anti-slavery agitation in Britain in the 1780s and 1790s as another element of, of an insistence on some sort of popular influence uh, and trying to unseat the power of not only of, of what they see as a West Indian lobby, but also of a West Indian lobby in co co collusion with, with the monarch. So there is, a real, there is a real sort of popular sentiment. But again, there are other people who see the French, I mean, see the American Revolution as an elaborate French plot. Um, uh, and uh, this argument, I mean, this argument is a minority view in the, in, in, in the, in the 1780s, um, but it's a view which is held by some fairly serious people. 